Hello friends, welcome back. Today's video is a little bit off topic for ham radio. However, I use a table saw in order to build one of my antenna products. And here you see a new to me used Delta Rockwell table saw. I purchased this saw on Facebook Marketplace from a previous owner who was a contractor who built homes for many, many years. And then the saw sat in storage in a barn for about 20 years. And uh, of course, picked up some rust and some other effects of not being used for a long period of time. However, it's functionally a pretty good saw. It needs a little bit of work and we're gonna roll it into the shop and see if we can get it back in shape again. This is not a full restoration video, it's more of a functional restoration. I'm simply getting this saw to the point where it works for my needs. And it's a chunky saw, it takes a little bit of work to get it into the shop, especially solo. It does have wheels, but they didn't spin. Here's the old saw it's replacing. This is a Clark saw that was manufactured in England a little uh, tabletop saw, 10 inch. And unfortunately, I just can't get this saw to work for me. I can never get the fence to stay square. Every time I lock the fence down, unfortunately, it, uh, it just doesn't stay square. It doesn't lock square. And it's really not meant for the type of use that I'm putting in, in my shop. It's just too small. So the first step first, we're going to go ahead and remove the blade. Gotta love the little uh, screwdriver hold down there to get the blade, get the blade out. The right hand thread on the pulley shaft. There she is. That blade is seeing a bit of use. There weren't even any words left on it. I imagine it's cut a lot of wood. Let's blow out some of the sawdust, and some of the critters and spiders and other things that were living in there. Now the spindle shaft moves up and down so you can raise and lower the blade. And I was looking for a way here to try and lubricate the gears. Unfortunately, they're kind of hidden by that shield. It's a wood chip shield or a sawdust shield. And boy, oh boy, there's no way I'm getting those bolts out. I tried, <laughs> but unfortunately those screws are not coming out of there. So we'll have to figure out another way to get some lubrication down in the gears so that I can get the blade height adjusted without too much effort. Of course, a little spray lubricant never hurts. Get it right down in there. And then we'll work the wheel that raises and lowers the blade height a few times to loosen everything up. When I first tried it, it was very, very stiff. It had collected a lot of debris from when it had been sitting in the barn. So with a little lubricant and a little bit of effort, running it back up and down, you can see pretty clearly there that the spindle is raising and lowering. It just got easier and easier the more I worked it. Now here you'll see a pin. In a moment, it's going to come flying out at you. This is the pin that allows you to remove the motor. And it's supposed to slide right in and out. I ended up having to beat this thing out. I thought it was rusted, but oh boy, was I wrong. Uh, this is uh, called paying the stupid tax for not reading the manual. But this pin took a lot of effort to come out and it didn't need to go out that way. I made the mistake of forcing that pin out when I should have looked a little bit closer. The pin's a bit rusty, but it's really not too bad. The problem was I completely missed the set screw. You can see it right there, a little set screw that's in the housing. If I had loosened that set screw, the pin would have come right out with just a little bit of effort. I didn't know that, so I ended up beating out the pin, which of course gouged uh, due to the set screw being there. Now here's that little guy. That little pin is pretty tough. It left a big gouge in that uh, in the connection rod, but yeah, paid my stupid tax today. Over to the vise we go. I'll have to do some filing on the connecting rod because of the groove I created and also it's got some rust on it and it had some pitting not from my <clears throat> extreme efforts but just due to age and use so a little bit of flat filing I could have done this on the grinding wheel 
and cleaned it up but I had the hand file handy and it really didn't take too long maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes of hand filing to get rid of the groove or at least file it down so it wasn't sharp and clean up the pin and more filing and a little more filing and some more filing she's getting there though next a little cleanup with a scotch bright pad this helps remove some of the surface rust and some of the other debris left over from my filing there we go still has a groove in it but perfectly functional and uh, I won't make the same mistake twice all right now we're going to move on to the bracket that supports the motor and there's a, uh, an arm that extends out of the back that holds I used I believe it used to hold the sawdust shield and unfortunately that did not come with this saw I don't have a shield I don't have a riving knife with it but this needed a little bit of work anyway we might as well get it get it looking a little bit better functioning a little bit better so maybe I can find some parts in the future and get this uh, back in safe operating order I like to have a shield and I like to have a riving knife if I can't find one I might have to make one so a little bit of lubricant a little bit of scotch bright and through the magic of YouTube we're getting all polished up here and good to go a little bit of paste wax to keep the rust from coming back at least for the time being and a little bit of wax inside of the connector and also on the rod I could certainly use grease on the rod I suppose but if I ever need to move the saw and take the motor out uh, I should have taken it out for transport but I couldn't get the rod out um, it should be transported with the motor out and if I ever need to do it again in the future I can pull that connecting rod out without getting grease all over my hands here's a little bit of anti-seize on the bolts they really weren't in bad shape at all they had hardly any rust on them but I'm just kind of in the of the opinion that a little bit of anti-seize on most of the nuts and bolts that go into these saws and really any power tool is a good idea because if you do ever have to take it off again in the future it may be a long time before you have to take it off and it would be best if it wasn't stuck when you went to do so here's the connecting rod just doing a quick test fit and yeah that works perfect that works exactly the way it should work of course with the set screw removed which is what I didn't do in the beginning all right the plate is gone so I don't know what size it is or what uh, how many horsepower the plates missing but the belt seems to be in good shape all right let's take a look at the electrical box and see how the connections look are still pliable that's good the wire nuts seem to be in good shape yeah I don't see any dry rotting I think we'll leave that be these screw heads could use a little help though really just a little light cleaning there's no need for me to go into super detail if I wanted to restore it and repaint everything I could but I'm really not going for that plus I love the I love the patina on industrial tools paint this gray color has this you know it's been used and it has some history
You know what, though? This plate is... This plate is bent. I'm going to see if I can straighten it out on the vise. When it's bolted on there, it's got this corner that's exposed. Let's see if I can fix that. It's a little straighter. Yep, that'll work. All right. Now that we've inspected some of the electrical internals, I'm just taking some wet wipes and cleaning off uh, all the dust and grime and debris of the last 20 years that it's been sitting in the barn. All right. Next, we're going to reinstall the bracket that supports the motor. A little bit of anti-seize on the bolts. And the support bracket will bolt right in. One thing I did notice on the bracket, you can't really see it in the video, but the bolt that's closest to me, or actually the, the hole that's closest to me, where the bolt threads into, that's a big piece of cast iron it supports the spindle and the pulley. And it's actually cracked and broken on the bolt that's closest to me. It'd be the right-hand side as you're viewing it from the back of the saw. So I was a little bit gentle with that didn't seem to affect it at all. The casting was cracked, but the bolt went right in. Here I am hooking up the belt under the pulley. The weight of the motor holds and tensions the pulley, which is a pretty neat idea. You don't have to do any tensioning to it. You just let the weight of the motor do the work. Then I plug in the electrical connection. And of course, come back and tighten the set screw. That set screw is nearly impossible to see. Of course, if I had read the manual, I would have known it was there. But uh, I guess I had to find out things the hard way. That's the way it goes sometimes. All right, back over to the vise to take a look at the fence. Now, this is a big, heavy fence. One end of the fence is cast iron. The rest of it is stamped steel. You can see here that I put the fence in the vise and then had second thoughts. I was a little bit sheepish about pinching the fence in the vise. I didn't want to bend that stamped steel part of the fence. So I ended up backing the fence out a little bit and clamping it where it had some more support. But it is clamped very lightly and it's supported on the outside end so there's not much pressure on the fence itself. I really don't want to bend that fence. It needs to be straight. This is the locking mechanism for the fence. We're looking at it from the bottom. Take off that old Bakelite knob should have seen some of the stuff that came out of the inside of that. It was, uh, it was pretty dirty. And that shaft for the locking mechanism uh, was rough. It looked like somebody had taken vice grips to it. This is the fine adjustment screw that comes out. You can see it's got a gear-like end on it that engages with the rail and allows you to get a fine, fine adjustment on the fence. Some more time taken with the file here to get that lock shaft cleaned up. It was very sharp. Somebody had pliers on it, and I, I can't quite figure out why. Somebody must have locked it down and was unable to get it out. But a few minutes with the file took care of that. Next comes some grease for the locking mechanism itself. It was pretty stiff and didn't want to move. But after a little bit of grease in there and a little bit of cleaning, worked it back and forth a bit, loosened right up.
Yep. Nice and free now. Put the bake light knob back on. I'm actually kind of surprised it wasn't cracked. But it tightened up just fine. I didn't have to do anything else to it. The fine adjustment knob and shaft, that needs a little bit of work as well. So we'll grab some Scotch-Brite and get that cleaned up. Yeah, that's looking just fine right there. Now we'll clean it up with the rag, and then we'll get some grease on it. Like I said, this fence is very, very heavy. That whole rear section where all of this uh, hardware gets into is all cast iron. Uh, very, very heavy duty. And this grease will help allow that fine adjustment knob to run smoother. The teeth on that shaft actually engage with the bottom of the guide rail, which is in the front of the saw. Probably didn't need to grease that too much, but uh, actually I think that might have been the perfect amount. Now we'll insert that back in, so give it a quick spin. Oh yeah, much better. Next, there are four bearing surfaces inside the head of the fence and you can see I was just cleaning them out with some Scotch-Brite and then putting in a little bit of paste wax. I don't want to put grease in these because these ride along the front rail and if I put grease in there then every time I move the fence it'll smear grease all over the front of the guide rail and since that's where I'm standing and where I'm leaning over the saw I'd constantly be getting grease all over myself so we'll use wax for that part. The grease in the other sections the fine adjustment knob uh, won't affect me when I'm working the saw. I won't get grease all over me is what I'm trying to say. Next I'll move on to the face of the fence. Now this one side of the fence face, actually be the left side as you're looking at the saw, was really well used. All of the factory paint was gone. It had been worn down right to the metal and the metal had rusted. So a little in for a little closer look this is what I'm going for, just a nice, smooth finish. I'm not too worried about some of the deeper pitting. That's natural with a steel product. I just want it nice and smooth so the wood runs clean against it. And when I put some wax on it, it'll help protect it and keep it from rusting this badly. But it's really not bad. Even this area that's quite dark is very smooth to the touch. It's kind of interesting to note that the other side of the fence still has the factory paint. <laughs> so it's pretty obvious what side of the rip fence got the most use. It wasn't this side, but this side cleaned up pretty well. I'll put some wax on it and the fence will be ready to go. Hi everyone, just a quick note while, uh, before I get sanding on the table here, no products that you see in this video were provided for me. I'm not sponsored in any way. This, I purchased all of this with my own money. I'll, I will be using a power sander to sand the top of this table with 400 grit wet dry sandpaper. Uh, very, very lightly. I have no intention of trying to remove any of the surface of this table. The only thing I want to do is get rid of some of this surface rust very lightly, very lightly, and then wax the table. So I'm not trying to polish it, I'm not trying to make it look super shiny. I need to get it smooth so I can get a protective coat of wax on it. So I will spare you the very loud palm sander, but this is a nice shot of what it looks like right now, and then I'll show you another picture after. Well, okay, maybe a little bit of the sanding, because why not? <laughs> yep, a little bit of the sanding. This took some time, that's for sure. 
I'm working the sander back and forth following the grain of the table. The table was, the, the cast iron was, or, or steel, however, I don't know if it was cast or steel, I guess I'm assuming it's cast iron, uh, has a grain to it. It runs front from the front of the table to the back of the table. And by sanding this way, following the grain very lightly, also in the channels with some wet dry sandpaper in the power sander, uh, it cleaned up really well. It got a lot of the rust off the tabletop, especially the high spots. Um, some of the stains, you're not going to be able to get those out. And I wasn't going for a perfectly shiny, rebuilt, factory finished table. I don't think this thing would ever be there without a whole lot of polishing. But I wanted to make it functional. Sanding up the channels here, getting everything wiped down before we move to the next step. I'm just using my miter gauge as a quick test just to make sure there's no big sections that I missed or big pieces of rust or debris in the channel. Okay, here we are after a light sanding with 400 grit, wet, dry sandpaper. And you can, still, there, you can see there are still some stains, but it's much smoother, and some of the heavier rust spots are very smooth. You can't really feel any bumps anymore. So now I'm going to continue with a Scotch-Brite pad and see if we can brighten it up a little bit before applying wax. I just wanted to pause here for a moment and show the difference the Scotch-Brite makes. This part of the table you're looking at now was sanded just with the wet, dry, 400 grit sandpaper. And after a few minutes with Scotch-Brite, I mean, that's pretty impressive. That is a world of difference. I can't wait to finish this up. I'll do this next section with the Scotch-Brite and then give it a coat of wax. Clean up the center, uh, the uh, cut plate, the center plate, throat, and then show you when it's all done. Yep, that Scotch-Brite definitely made a difference on the surface. I did all of the Scotch-Brite work by hand. Spent a good 15 minutes or so just really getting that Scotch-Brite to try and remove some of the stains and it did an admirable job. A lot of the stains are going to be there for the life of the tabletop unless it's completely refinished which I won't be doing. Now the wax goes on, wax on, wax off. All of the channels I let the wax dry. I've only done one coat just to just to get it done. I'm also doing the rails, the guide rails for the fence. Uh, one coat for now. I'll probably put on a second coat at some point in time in the future but for right now, one coat is fine. Now a bit of polishing to remove the wax. And leave a nice smooth surface for the saw. One coat of uh, paste wax did a great job. It's just an automotive paste, paste wax. Did a really good job making this tabletop just so smooth. Like I said, you still see stains in it. You still see some of the deeper pits, but to the touch, it's very, very smooth, and the wood should have no trouble riding along it. This is the front guide rail. I love these etched, the etched ruler in the front guide rail. Just kind of neat. Here's the fence installed. This is working just fine. The fine adjustment knob is nice and smooth. You can, oops, I hit the blade there. I shouldn't have done that. I wasn't expecting it to actually slide, <laughs> actually slide that smoothly. And I accidentally bumped the blade, but it runs very, very smooth back and forth. It locks down just fine. I did have to do some adjustment on this fence. The back rail actually was not attached to the table correctly. It was missing shims. So I did have to pull the back rail off the table and replace some uh, put in shims in the back, but it still worked just fine. All right, here I am scoring up the blade to the table. We're almost ready to cut wood here. I wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to watch this video. I really appreciate it. Please leave me a comment if you have any questions. I'm making sure at this point the blade is square to the miter channel, 
and it was good to go. I'm going to do a quick test cut on some plywood. I know there's no safety guard in place. Like I said, the saw didn't come with one, so I'll have to either build one or make one on aftermarket. The same thing with a riving knife. But for now, we can cut some plywood as long as we're careful. That wood just slid so smoothly across the table, just like butter. So nice. The cut was perfectly smooth. It really worked out well. So not a fully restored saw, but certainly very, very functional and much better than it was uh, when it came out of the barn. Next, we'll try a piece of, po um, is it poplar or ash? <clears throat> Sorry, I think this is ash. It's about three inches thick. I probably don't have the right blade on here for this. It's more of a ripping blade, not a cross-cutting blade, uh, or more for plywood, I guess, but I'm not cross-cutting. I'm ripping anyway. But it didn't matter. The saw handled it perfectly fine, went through nice and smooth. The off-cut side had a little fuzz on it. Certainly not the fault of the saw probably the blade. It's kind of a general purpose blade, although it does have a fair number of teeth. But the cut side here was just beautiful. It was nice and square, very smooth to the touch. Super happy. Well, there you have it. A Rockwell saw is back in action. Thanks, everyone.